Hello, Jinx 8th graders. This is Mr. Zelensky from the Planetarium. And unfortunately, we will not be able to meet our second time this year. But I still wanted to give you a, a fun lesson and, and introduce you to the things that we were going to look at in our class. Now, we were going to watch a show called Oasis in Space. Now, I've sent a link, uh, hopefully along with this link, uh, that you can go and watch that show. Uh, it is about the search for water in our solar system. We know Earth's got water. But where is it else in the solar system? And hopefully you've watched that and uh, realized it's, uh, it's quite common. Water is in a lot of places in our solar system. Not necessarily liquid water, but the molecule of water is quite common in our solar system. After that show, we were then going to go into these two topics, the HR diagram and the life cycle of stars. Now, the HR diagram is... Well, the most important diagram probably in astronomy. Uh, you guys are probably aware of the periodic table for chemistry. Well, this is the periodic table for, for astronomers. Uh, this graphs stars, and based on the position on the graph, tells us a lot of information. Now, there is a lot of information on this graph, so what I'm hoping to do is simplify this so it is very, very simple for you. So I'm going to simplify this graph by just first off looking at the bottom. All right, so here's the bottom of the graph. Now the bottom of the graph simply takes stars, looks at their color of their surface, and through the color of their surface, we can tell their temperature. So you can see it's labeled surface temperature, and over here is on the red side. This is 3,000 degrees Kelvin, and when it gets really hot, it turns blue, and that's 30,000 degrees Kelvin. All right, and you can see it goes through the colors of the rainbow, except green, white is replaced with, uh, green is replaced with white. But for the most part, in rainbow order, from 3,000 Kelvin all the way to 30,000 Kelvin, the surface temperature of the star. Now, this might already be a little confusing to you, because you might be asking Mr. Z, why is the cold temperature, or the colder temperature, why is that red, when that's really not how we associate with that? Because when you go to, uh, well, let, let me show you. In nature, believe it or not, this is actually what occurs more often. You do actually have colder temperatures represented with red and hotter temperatures with blue. Let me show you. If you've ever looked very close at a candle flame or, or any flame at all, you will notice that the very base of the flame is bluish in color, and that is the hottest part of the flame. Whereas on the outside of the flame, it is very red. And that is the cooler part. Now, again, most of this time I say coolest or I'll be saying cold or colder, but please realize 3,000 degrees Kelvin is still very, very hot to us as humans. Uh, so stars and all this stuff, they're all hot compared to us. But compared to other stars, there are cold stars, 3,000 degree Kelvin, and hot stars, 30,000 degree Kelvin on their surface. So this is happens in nature a lot more often than you think. Blue stuff is hotter than the red stuff. Now, why is it that that's not the way we look at it? When we go to the sink to wash our hands, red is the hot water and blue is the cold water. So why, why the reverse? Why the difference? Well, a long time ago, they decided to make these colors match what happens to our skin. And so when you get a sunburn, your skin turns red. And when you get hypothermia, your skin turns blue. And so that's what they want to associate the water with. So even though it doesn't match what happens in nature, it does sort of make sense with what happens to our skin. But nonetheless, what you need to know for here is hot stuff is blue and cooler stuff are, is red. Now the other thing the HR diagram uh, charts is luminosity. Now luminosity is the amount of energy given off by the star. That's a topic for another one. Just to keep things simple today, I just want you really to focus on size. The bigger stars, the smaller stars, that kind of thing. So our small stars are always going to be down here at the bottom of the graph, and our bigger stars are always going to be at the top of the graph. All right, so we're just going to look at temperature and size. Keep this very simple, because I really want you walking away more of the concept of the HR diagram more than the details. You can get that a little bit later. So let's get going here. Here's two stars. I have a blue star and I have a red star. Where do we put them on the HR diagram? Now at first it's probably very simple. Red stars of course go to the right side and blue stars of course go to the left side. That one is easy. 
The real question is, do blue stars go up here or down there? Or do red stars go up there or down there? But basically, what makes a star hot? What makes a star cold? Is it their size? Are red stars big and or small or blue stars big or small? So we need to figure out a way to where to put these two stars, the red and the blue. Well, let me give you an analogy. Let's pretend there I am. Here I am in my house. And you can see I've given myself a red background because I have the air conditioning on. So it's very cool in my house. But let's say I invited a few friends. All right. Now, as you all know, when you put a, a group of people into a room, what happens to that room? It gets a little warmer. So the temperature of the room changes and gets a little warmer. Now let's do the same thing, but instead of just adding a few friends, let's add all of you. So all of yous are coming over to my place now, and you're crowding up my, my, uh, the room. And of course, the temperature of the room is going to get very, very hot because there's more stuff in the room, more humans in the room. So if you take this analogy, it's very simple. When I had very few people in my house, yes, it got warmer, but not as warm as when everybody came to my house. So what's the difference between the two? Mass. When you add more mass to the room, it got hotter. All right, so now take that same, uh, same idea of this lower mass, lower temperature, higher mass, higher temperature, and relate it to the stars. When the blue, so in order for the blue star to be hot, it must be big, and then vice versa for the red star. In order for the red star to be cold, it must be small. So it goes to the bottom of the graph. So this is the general rule that, we, uh, that stars tend to follow. So now that we have two points on a graph, we're simply going to connect those two points. All right, And what we call it is the main sequence line. Now this line seems very simple to make, right? We didn't do anything too complicated here. We just figured out blue stars are big. Red stars are small on, on, uh, on average. And then we connected them into a main sequence. But what's the coolest part here is this very simple line to come up with represents 90% of the stars out there. We've learned most stars are on this line. So all of a sudden, this line becomes very, very useful. So very simple to make and yet super useful in practicality. Because, for example, how big is our sun? Do we have a very large sun? Now, of course, to the humans, to us human size, yes, the sun's huge. Um, now, we, of course, live on the planet Earth, and Earth, we think Earth's big too, and the sun dwarfs the Earth. The sun's super big. So if we take the sun, but don't compare it to us, take the sun and compare it to these red dwarfs or these blue super giants, where does it lie then? Well, very simply, look very closely at our sun, it's a orangish color, like an orangish yellow color. Well, simple. We just find orangish yellow on our graph, and that's where sun, the sun goes. So we now know, without having to travel away from the planet, we now know the sun is a quite small star when comparing it to other stars. It's on the small side. We didn't have to leave the planet or anything. So this graph already, hopefully you see the very usefulness in the graph, in the HR diagram. Now let me draw your attention to a different star. Here's the constellation Orion. If you want to trace him out, he looks something like this. There's his head, his shoulders. This is his arm with his shield out front. Here's his belt and his uh, knees or feet are here on the bottom. Now I want to draw your attention to that foot. Look how bright and blue that star is. That star named Rigel. Now, Rigel is a great example of a blue super giant star. Right? It's very big. It's very hot. So that's a blue super giant. Now, let me show you just how big a super giant star is. So let's start here. There's Earth. There we are. That little dot right there. That's the Oif. And then there's Jupiter. All right, so Jupiter, our largest planet, you can see the difference between the two. And then there's the sun, very, very large. Compared to Earth, the sun, very, very different, okay? That's pretty self-explanatory. But what I need you now to realize is how much bigger Rigel is to the sun. And I can't just jump right to it. I want to do this by stages because I want to introduce to you the fact that there are bigger stars. 
So there's the sun. Actually, you should know there's bigger stars. We just proved that the sun is very uh, small. So here's Sirius A. It is one of the brightest stars. It is the brightest nighttime star in our sky there. Look how much bigger it is. And then bigger than Sirius is the star Vega, a star that comes up in the summertime. And then even bigger than Vega is Arcturus. And you think, look how small Vega is already. Vega is super small compared to Arcturus. And Arcturus is small compared to Rigel. Rigel is huge. So now let's think of this in reverse. Think about way back here when we started. Sun to Sirius. Sirius to Vega. Vega to Arcturus. Arcturus to Rigel. So think of it backwards. Think about where the sun, how big the sun would be over here in our little scale here. The sun's a speck. A speck to Rigel. Absolutely incredible on how big Rigel is. All right. Let me draw you to another star. So that was Rigel right down here. Let's draw you to the other corner of Orion to a star named Betelgeuse. Now Betelgeuse, you'll notice, is not only super bright, but it's reddish in color. Well, let's go back to our table. Betelgeuse, reddish in color, right there, right? And the reason it might just be so bright on this thing, it might be close, right? So it's red and small, but it's close, and that's why it looks very bright here. Well, no, Betelgeuse is actually not a red dwarf. Betelgeuse is one of the largest stars we know of, a red super giant star. There is Betelgeuse compared to Rigel. It's bigger. It's bigger than the blue super giant. But Betelgeuse is huge. But that, of course, then leads to the question, why is Betelgeuse red, cool, and big? That kind of goes against what we just learned. Betelgeuse should be small if it's red, right? Well, the answer is Betelgeuse is dying. All right, Betelgeuse is on its last kind of legs here in stellar, in, in stellar life which is gonna lead us to exactly that topic. Let's talk about the life cycle of a star. How is a star born? What happens during its life? Well, how does it die? What happens after it's dead? That kind of thing. Let's go through the life cycle of a star. Now, I'm a big fan of analogies. I like when you can relate things to other things. So to me, I'm gonna relate the life cycle of a star to a party. As I know you eighth graders, you love to party, I'm sure. You like to go out with your friends and such. Well, that's what I'm going to compare it to. We're going to compare a party with uh, throwing a party with making a star. All right. Now, for a party, I can think of two things you absolutely need to have in order to have a party. And that is people and food. If you don't have people, you don't have a party. And if you don't have food, they're not going to stay. So if you think of those two things for a party, relate it now to the star. The star needs mass and it needs fuel, all right? It needs mass and fuel, people, and food. That's the two relationships we're going to make here with this analogy. So let's start with the party. And let's start with talking about people and the mass of the star. So let's pretend I'm going to throw a party and I want to make sure I get all the invitations out. And so I take a map of Jinx and I put where everybody I'm going to invite, I put a little dot on the map. So you can see this are, these are everybody I'm going to invite. Now, if I took uh, a little pen and I, and I outlined the shape that all these dots have made for me, I'm going to get a shape that looks similar to this. And you can't really describe it. It's not a circle, not a square, not a rectangle. It's just sort of a blob. It's irregular. So that happens to match the shape of how stars are born. It's called a nebula. Nebula is just a big fancy word that means cloud. But these, this is where stars start. They start in a nebula, a cloud of gas and dust floating off in space. But you can see it's just random in shape. They're not circular yet. They don't have any real shape to them. They're just blobs in space, clouds in space. All right, so that's where it starts. Then some activity happens in the nebula, whether it's an explosion from a distant star that activates and excites some molecules, maybe it's a, a, just a change, in, uh, a change in location, but something happens that sparks. And, the, wherever the, and for our analogy, the party's going to start. So the party's going to be here. So you're going to see everybody, of, of course, start to head for the party. Now, once they're all in one place, 
the shape is very simple. It's a circle, or three-dimensionally, a sphere. Okay, so we took all those people and we now moved them into, and that's what happens to the nebula. The, the nebula, that big blob that you saw out there, all collapse towards one point. Now that everybody's in my house, my house warms up a little bit. It goes from that cool red to that nice yellow color because we're going to represent the sun in this party. So it's like an average, you know, our sun size party. All right, so we have the people, we have the mass. We have lots of mass. Combine all the people have come into our home. My home is now nice and warm. The party has begun. Now, let's talk about the fuel, though. I can't keep you at my party if I don't feed you. So I'm going to go to Walmart, and I'm going to get 10 billion years of food. Now, that seems stupid, Mr. Z. We don't live 10 billion years. I understand. But this is the weird part of the analogy that we have to sort of go with because of the fact that stars do live billions of years. So we're going to stretch human lifetime a little bit in this example, and we're going to pretend that we can live billions of years. And so I buy 10 billion years of pizza. Now here's, of course, the problem. These toppings. Ugh, who likes mushrooms? Nobody likes mushrooms. We'll get rid of those. The green peppers are gross. Pepperoni, get rid of that too. This is what we want. We just want the pizza. We just want the pizza. So the pizza is the fuel, and we're going to call all these toppings that we got rid of, we're going to call that the waste. We're going to get rid of that from the fuel. All right, so here's our analogy. The fuel is the pizza. The toppings are the waste. How does that relate to the star? Well, the stars have 10 billion years of hydrogen. Hydrogen's the main chemical in the star. All right, the main element in the star. So now, you take a hydrogen atom, and you take another hydrogen atom, and you slam them together in nuclear fusion. When, you, when that happens, you get a whole lot of energy and then, of course, you get your helium. But your helium is your waste product. All right, we don't need the helium right now. All we care about are those two hydrogen atoms colliding to give us the fuel that we need for the star to burn. The waste is the helium. We'll come back to that later. All right, so we have our star. We have the mass of the star smashing into the same point. So that creates that nuclear fusion to give us the energy we need. For the party, we have the people, we have the food. Let's party. 10 billion years later, I'm out of food. Everybody gets very unhappy. I'm out of food. What can we do? Well, somebody comes up with a great idea. Well, yeah, we're, we're out of pizza, but we got a bunch of these pepperonis here. Why don't we just eat those instead? Everybody's like, oh, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Now we're happy again. We're happy again. Now we're going to eat our pepperoni. All right. That's what happens to the star. When the star uses up its first fuel source, it transfers to the second fuel source. So now the waste product of helium is now fused together to create more energy to keep the star alive, but now has a different waste product of carbon. All right, so we've changed fuel source from the pizza to the pepperoni. Stars changed from hydrogen, now using helium as the fuel. Now, this doesn't last very long. Pepperoni is much smaller than pizza. Helium is much heavier than hydrogen, so this doesn't take as long to get to the empty stage. So only one billion years later, we're already back out of food. All right. So we're like, well, we got two other waste, right? Well, we're a small star. Yeah, we're not going to eat that. That's green peppers and mushrooms. Those are gross. All right. Smaller stars, uh, when you think about it, a smaller party it's not easy to convince a few people to eat this bad stuff. They're not going to do it. So the small star stops right there and says, nope, we're not going to, we're not going to eat any more of that. And so, of course, if people are done eating, they're going to do one thing at a party, and that's leave. And so they all start to leave the party. Now, here's the thing, though. you got to realize this party's not dead. The party now is dying. I haven't officially ended the party. The music's still going and everything, it's just people are leaving. And so technically the size of the star is increasing. My house is the same size, but every molecule in the party, all the people in the party are leaving the house, expanding the size of my star. But here's the other thing to think about. The house is here. That's where it's hot. That's where the heat was. And they're leaving that. They're walking away from that heat. So they themselves are getting colder. 
You see where this is leading? As they leave the house, the star expands, and as they leave the house, they get cooler. This is the a perfect explanation of why a red supergiant is formed when stars are dying. Remember Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse was a dying star. Why was it a red supergiant? Because it's dying. The star's shells, the star's chemicals are expanding away from that core, cooling down and making the star appear super big. So not only is the HR diagram now helping us with temperature, color, size, luminosity, but it's also telling us the age. The sun is on the main sequence. It's an adult. But as it gets older, it's going to drift up here to the red supergiant. It's telling us over here, this top right, are older dying stars. Now, eventually I do have to end. I mean, I'm here by myself now. Everybody's left the house. I should just end the party. And that's exactly what I do. I release everybody and the star explodes. Everybody goes off into space and you form this beautiful, we'll call a loose explosion here. We'll call it loosely, we'll call it an explosion of a planetary nebula. These are gorgeous, gorgeous things in space here. Now, let me explain what you're looking at. Here in the middle, that's me. That's me. That's the core of the star just sitting in the house alone. Now everybody else is left. All this is you guys leaving the party. All right, and this planetary nebula is going to slowly expand out in space, just indefinitely, just keep flying out in space and expand. But I want you to realize this is a death of a star. Probably something you expected to be like a big explosion, but it really doesn't look like that. It looks actually more peaceful than that. Well, think about it. If you're at a party and, you know, there's only 20 of us there or something, and you go to leave, you're going to leave very politely. You're going to thank Mr. Z, thanks for the party, and you're going to politely leave, giving this very beautiful exit to the star. I like to call these the poof. They're not really a kaboom. They're just a, like you're blowing up a bubble and then it just goes poof. And that's all it is. It's just this release of the shells of the stars off into space. The planetary nebula, beautiful, beautiful thing in space. Now, let's talk about me. All right, I'm left in the house all by myself. So, of course, that makes the star very, very small. So now we're down here. Now, why is it a white dwarf and not a red dwarf? Well, remember, I'm the core. I'm the core of the party. My house is still hot. And so it's going to be a little hotter than the red dwarf. It's going to be over here because I'm now just the leftover core of a star. And so here's where stars go to die. Here's where they live most of their life. Then they go up here to start dying, and once they're dead, they're down here at the bottom. A white dwarf. All right, we name stars, as you're noticing through this, we name their stars pretty simply color and size. So a white dwarf right here on the bottom. Now that was a sun size party. That first party we just discussed, that's what happens if the party is this big. What if the party is that big? What if I threw a different party, but this one is huge? I invite everybody in Jinx, or maybe even all of Tulsa over to my house, and we're going to have a huge, super giant party. Are there any differences that occur in these parties versus these parties? Let's find out. Now, of course, our first party, we had mass, uh, mass and people equaled the same thing. Well, this time, more mass, more people. We're just going to get more and more people into my place and so here's more people invited they're all gonna jam themselves into my house and of course when you put that many people into one small area the house gets very very warm and that's what makes the star blue that more mass the more people it's getting very warm in my place now with the food and fuel situation i did the same thing i went to walmart and i got the same food but that's a problem right I mean, we, we got the hydrogen reaction. We got the two hydrogens running in and giving us fuel and waste. But look at all these people I have to feed. If I have to feed more people, then the food's going to run out quicker. So only after 10 million years, which I know sounds a lot to us humans, but compare this to the first star, which lasted 10 billion years, only after 10 million years, everybody's sad. 
Everybody's mad. I'm out of food. And so they, of course, come up with the great idea. Oh, we got the pepperonis. We're cool. And, of course, that's what the star does. It goes and says, all right, there's the helium. Let's use up the helium. We'll combine the helium, get our energy. Waste product is now carbon. One million years later, very, very short in, a star, in star terms, they're already hungry again. But now we have enough people that somebody out there will like the green peppers. So they're going to eat the green peppers. So we have some people out there taking the helium, taking the, and so in the, in the chemistry form, it's taking helium, carbon, putting them together, and now we're making oxygen as a waste product, but keeping the energy, keeping the fuel of the star going. And eventually, only a thousand years later, there wasn't that many green peppers, we're out of food again. Oh my goodness. So, well, we still got mushrooms, and there's enough people at the party, some people will like mushrooms. So they'll eat the mushrooms. So they're, uh, chemical-wise, we're taking oxygen, taking the carbon, smacking them together, making silicon, still producing energy. The star is making itself survive as long as it can. But only a hundred years. And for a star, that's nothing. It's a blink of an eye to a star. Everybody's hungry again. Now, depending on the size of the party, we could continue to go down the periodic table. You'll notice we started here at hydrogen. Hydrogen turned to helium. Helium turned to carbon. Carbon turned to oxygen. Oxygen turned into silicon. Okay, we keep going down the periodic table. We could, if the star is super big, if the party is even bigger, we could survive even longer. Silicon, higher, 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 higher down the periodic table. The bigger the star, the further down the periodic table we would go. But for this example, that's as far as we are gonna go. These guys are done. We are out of here. Now let's think about it. If you have this many people in one place and you've now upset them because you have no more food, do you think they're leaving politely? No. Supernova. This is the explosion of a huge star. Uh, these, this is really probably what you expected with the first one. When a star explodes, you hear that star explosion. This is what you picture. Supernova. These are the kaboom. Look how chaotic it looks. There's no symmetry here. There's no beautiful circle or poof here. No, this is a kaboom. The big star. Now, where am I? Well, I'm now called a neutron star. It's one of the few stars on the periodic table, or uh, sorry, on the HR diagram. That's called different, uh, but we call it a neutron star because it um, basically made mostly of neutrons at that point. That's the science of it. But what we care about or going with our story here is the fact that uh, I'm still small because I'm the only one left at the party, but I am very hot because it was a lot of people in my house and so my house is left very, very warm. But notice I'm still on the bottom of the graph here, bottom left, where dead stars are. So adult stars, dying stars, dead stars are always on the bottom. Now let's talk just real briefly, let's finish off here with the afterlife. What happens, let's first talk about myself, the, the host of the party, the two cores. What's going to happen to them? Well first let's talk about the white dwarf. Okay, now the white dwarf, uh, so let's go back to the first party. Uh, well, my life's pretty boring. I'm going to simply clean up start cleaning my house, and I have a long time to do it because uh, basically the rest of my life, all that's going to happen is the white dwarf is going to slowly cool off, eventually get too cold to even stay on the graph, float off the HR diagram, and I'm never remembered again. That's what will happen to a white dwarf. They'll eventually cool off and fall off the HR diagram. Now, neutron stars have two options. Let's go to the analogy real quick. I had a huge party in my house. Now, I could do option A, which is do exactly what I did with the white dwarf, and that's just stay in my house, clean up my house for the rest of eternity. Eventually, my house will cool off and fall off the HR diagram, and I will be forgotten. Or, because my house is wrecked, I might hire myself a vacuum service to come help clean up. This is only an option for the big star, but I could form a black hole. The black holes are only possible after the death of a big star. Notice how I did not give myself an option to make a black hole from the small star. You have to be big. Now, in the analogy I used a vacuum service, I do not want you ending this, uh, ending this class here this lesson here, thinking that black holes suck things in like a vacuum. No, no, no. 
Black holes are large areas of gravity. They're pulling things in. All right, this, you can see that this is actually light stretching around the black hole due to this uh, large gravitational pull. So most of this light that you're seeing here is actually behind the black hole and it's stretching around. It's a, just a beautiful, beautiful thing. Black holes are quite amazing. But black holes can only, uh, only form w from big stars' death. So uh, the reason I bring that up is because I get the question a lot. Will the sun be a black hole when it dies? No, it's too small. Only the stars that started very large can have the chance of being a black hole. All right, now let's talk about you guys. You guys are the ones that attended the party. All right, so where are you guys going to go? Well, you guys are party animals. That's all you guys are. You're going to go find another party. So the star explodes, sends all of those chemicals, all of the stuff off into space until you stop somewhere and say, hey, you guys having a party? Cool, I'm going to join that party. And then you party for a few billion years there, and that party ends, and that explodes, and sending the chemicals off again, and then those explode. And you can see it just keeps expanding off into space, forming new and new, more new stars. Stars recycle. And if you're wondering where the oxygen we breathe, uh, the nitrogen and the oxygen we breathe in, where's the hydrogen uh, and the oxygen combining to get water, where are we getting these heavy metals, where do we get all these elements on our planet? You got to think stars. Th stars are what's cooking these elements. And when they explode, they just scatter it off into the universe to form solar systems elsewhere who will eventually, their star will die and send all the chemicals off into space to make another star or solar system elsewhere. And with that, that's the life cycle of a star. You start with a nebula, that blob of, of chemicals in space. And if you make an average sized star, you'll become a giant and then a planetary nebula, what we call the poof of an explosion and end in a white dwarf. Or you start with a nebula, but you make you gather a little more stars, make yourself very massive, then you end with a supergiant, and then a supernova, the biggest explosions out there. And then a neutron star, if you don't turn yourself into a black hole. Well, I hope you enjoyed those two lessons. Uh, oh, let's real quick, forgot about the HR diagram review. So in the HR diagram, you do have temperature across the bottom. The, te uh, the colors are there to help remind you. You have the luminosity vertically here. Uh, notice how size is actually on the diagonal, but size is here. Uh, but you can see this HR diagram tells us a ton. We get temperature, color, luminosity, size, and now you know age. Here's your main sequence. Here's your old stars. Here's your dead stars. It's a beautiful, beautiful diagram. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you got a lot out of that. And uh, hopefully see you uh, when you guys get to the high school then and uh, uh, take the astronomy class, and we'll see you some, for some labs. Until then, you guys have a great rest of your year. This is, Dan, uh, this is uh, Mr. Z, signing off.